All right. Thank you. So uh, I know the normal format is questions at the end, but uh, <laughs> I'm completely open with questions. At and you have 50 minutes until yeah. the end of the session. Well, so. I'm, I'm, I'm not <laughs> going to use all of that, but I'll go through the gist of what I want to say, and then we'll have a question period, and it can be five or however long this is, is needed. Um, my uh, research and my presentation is you know, based on trying to solve a problem with which I've been struggling for the 31 years I've been in Japan and, and teaching, which is you know, typically Japanese reticence in the classroom. For the most part, it's prevalent in language classrooms, uh, but uh, other colleagues that are, you know, for example, I've got a Canadian colleague teaching uh, Japanese modern history at Tokyo University, and he finds that the, the same kind of problem can uh, show its ugly, yeah, presents a problem as well. So um, this is uh, a method that I've uh, uh, recently developed that has been relatively successful in getting students motivated to participate in class. So um, basically for a group of teachers, you know, group of teachers that came to a presentation like this would probably be facing, would not be facing a situation like this where uh, a question thrown out to the group would elicit multiple students, right? Um, and I would say to a group, if this is your classroom, then you don't need to be here. <laughs> All right? However, more often than not, um, in a Japanese classroom, especially in the language classroom, we face uh, this kind of uh, setup, right? Um, personally, I'm at a at, uh, uh, Hoshi University, which is a pharmaceutical university. It's a six-year program. I'm teaching the first and second year students. Um, they are not particularly high in English. They are not particularly motivated in English. And to be honest, I can't really make a case that they need English <laughs> to be pharmacists in some local uh, pharmacy. But they have to be there, and I'm there to teach them. And so my goal is to make um, the class as enjoyable um, and as student-centered as I possibly can. Right? Now, there's um, a lot of research um, uh, about linking participation levels and uh, volume of teaching, by that volume of speaking by students, to increases in their fluency. In fact, one of the first studies uh, came out of the University of Toronto uh, because of a large number of immigrants uh, in Canada, which is where I'm from. Okay, so um, is it is it important in a worldwide sense? Yes, yes, it is. If if we look at what Japanese students typically go through in the junior and senior high school six years, uh, they're faced with teachers using predominantly Japanese in class. Um, use of English is minimal, and teacher speaking takes up anywhere from 80 to 90 percent of the class. So not only are students in a passive mode for six years of learning, but they're also subject to very little native English. So it's no wonder that when they come into university, um, they are shocked by not only the foreign teacher, but the foreign teacher's use almost entirely of English, and then the expectation that they're supposed to perform. I think they're hit by a lot of different things here, and uh, it it can be very difficult to, to change this paradigm. So when I ask myself, what what am I doing? What am I really doing with first year students when they come out of uh, high school and they they're in the first year of universities? To me, it is not teaching them English. Rather, it's it's training. You know, even the, the intermediate to advanced level English textbooks are only using junior high school level vocabulary. They are reviewing what they already saw fly by uh, in junior or senior high school. So I tell them from the first day, we are not here to study English. We are here to practice and train in the English that you already saw and were tested on. Can you use it? I know you can't. So. What you don't need is 90 more minutes of lecture. If you didn't understand English grammar from the Japanese lecture from your high school teacher, 
you're not going to under understand the lecture from me in English. What we need is to get on the bicycle and start riding, right? So my goals for the class are to have, you know, 90, 95, or even 100 percent of the class run in English. I want two-way communication either between students and myself or between each other, right? And I want the students producing the language, not just listening to it, certainly not writing it or reading it, but producing language in class. Now, um, a couple years ago at a JALT conference, I ran into a colleague I hadn't seen for, for 10 years. I only got a master's and was looking at doctoral work. He had started his doctoral, uh, his PhD at Nagoya University. And when I asked him what he was doing, he said, assessment. Now, I hope my eyes didn't completely glaze over when I heard assessment, but I'll tell you now what went through my mind. What a boring topic. Who cares about assessment? I mean, most people in Japan say it's the university entrance exams that kill six years of English teaching in junior and senior high school. But as is often the case with stupid people, they make a, a flash judgment at the beginning, and then a little while longer they start, the, they start to see the light. And that was exactly what happened to me. Lo and behold, as I was looking for a solution to this motivational and participation problem, assessment came to light. Um, in a very simple basis, there are two main areas of assessment, formative and summative. Summative is what is used most in Japan. There's a series of, of teaching and then there's a test at the end. It more often than not tests student on students on what they memorize rather than how they can use it. And the problem is this kind of assessment or testing gives very little feedback to them or motivation during the period of learning. Okay? Whereas formative is more ongoing assessment that happens every class or as often as possible that gives them their level but more importantly teaches them what they need to do in the remainder of this class or next week to improve. Okay? And so this is the area that I wanted to look at in changing the assessment in my classes. In addition, um, J.D. Brown, who's at the uh, University of Hawaii, this big uh, uh, guy in assessment and uh, statistical testing, said basically that there's good, there's good testing and there's bad testing. And good testing is testing that links to what students are doing in class every day. Okay? So um, if you're teaching them to swim, then you should have a swimming test at the end. If you're trying to get students to speak, and then you give them a paper test on grammar at the end of the term, those two are not really matched. So what I tried to put together was something that, you know, checked off these points and got students speaking. Okay. So again, this is what I am up against at uh, Hoshi University. Okay, it's a six-year program at, at fairly large uh, classes at 25. Uh, students per class, and it is mandatory for them in the first, in the second year. What are the classes? The first year class is called English Speaking. I have gone back to the topic of the title of this class many times. Again, it's not called reading, it's not called writing, it's not called speaking and listening, it's called speaking, right? And the second year mandatory course is called Discussions, which I've you know, amalgamated into discussions and presentations. The bottom line is both of these are verbal and both of them are output based. Okay? And so given that that's the name of the class, given that that's the goal of the university in forcing all their students into first year classes, um, I attempted to put together an assessment system that would motivate students to speak more. Now, I mean, I've studied Japanese and I've told my students a hundred thousand times, you really need to speak more. I've told them, you, you know, you go overseas, everybody's got their hand up, right? Um, I've told them about my year of studying Japanese in Nagoya, 
where the teacher basically gave us a, a newspaper article and said, prepare this for next day. And when she came in, in an hour class, she'd just come in and say, here's the article, any questions? And in an hour class, for four minutes, people had their hands up saying, you know, in Japanese, what does this mean? Does this mean A? Does this mean B? And she just answered questions for 40 minutes of the 60 minutes. The remaining 20 minutes she used to actually teach the article. And 20 minutes was all she needed because after 40 minutes, she knew exactly what the students knew and what they didn't know. And that's something the teacher in Japan cannot do without two-way communication from your students. How many times have you said, are there any questions? And there's this long silence, right? So, and I've told my students that story, right? And I've told them it in Japanese. There is not a student that can't understand my story, but there are still no students who have actually changed their behavior based on the story. So again, I needed to change the paradigm, okay? So that's what I went into and I thought, I mean, one of the beauties of being a university teacher is we can set our own syllabus and set our own assessment rubric. And so to not do that, to not adjust it for uh, either our own purposes or the needs of the students, I think is, is a huge waste. So what I did was this. I simply said 60% of your grade is going to be participation. And again, in the first year speaking test, uh, sorry, speaking class, I said 60% is participation and 40% will be a year-end speaking test, one-on-one, -on -one, and that's the whole thing. So there is no homework, there is no reading, there is no writing, there is only speaking. The 60% participation comes from effort and comes from voluntarily producing a speech act in class. If I ask a question like, what's today, nobody answers and I say, Roger, Roger gets nothing, even if he gives the right answer. So you've got to volunteer, okay? You do not have to answer the correct answer, but you do have to produce a full sentence because I wanted to move away from this high school paradigm, which is, you know, Yamaba ego de nanti uska, hai tanaka kun, he stands up, mountain, hai some tori desu, sit down, right? And the testing system, which is, you know, Yamaba ego de nanti uska, mountain, river, hill, stream, and you circle A, and that's right, okay? So, um, you need to produce a full sentence and you need to volunteer it, but you don't need to be correct. However, in the seven minute speaking test, you do need to be correct. So hopefully, this enhanced participation with no grading of, I mean, I would correct them, but they, they would get their, their grade even if they made a mistake. Mm -hmm. And then ending 40% with something that is accuracy based was going to get them speaking. So again, this was the first year speaking class the second year uh, discussions class was basically the same, 60% uh, participation. And then the remaining 40, giving a presentation, giving an interactive presentation in front of their classmates where they had to take questions and handle the 10 minutes that they were allotted. Okay? So with that set up, I thought, I was home free, all right? And what I did was I set this up and I told them this is what we were gonna do and everybody said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, are there any questions? No, absolutely no questions. And so I ran the class. Now, I don't run the class in any particularly different way. Use a regular textbook, okay? Um, and after the first term, I, well, I graded, not graded, I, I recorded the number of speech acts per student. What I got, was this. So after a 14 class uh, term, in one particular class, I had a total of 472 speech acts over uh, 14 classes, which means per 90 minute session, about 33. So in 90 minutes, 
somebody was saying something, one person was speaking every three minutes, run out of it, right? And per student was basically in a 90 minute class. If a student spoke twice, raised their hand and answered twice, they were above average. I was not uh, impressed with these results and my system was not working the way it was meant to. Okay? So what I did was I made a very small change, but something that ended up being uh, extremely important. I mean, a lot of people say the iPod was not a completely new product. It was lifted off, grafted off of the, the Sony Walkman, right? But the fact that it had a hard drive could be written to, rewrite it, uh, and songs could be played immediately was what jettisoned the, uh, the iPod to sales of a hundred, maybe a thousand times that of the, of the Walkman. Sometimes these small tweaks can make all the difference. So in the second term, what I did was this. I had the same, same system. But what I said to students was, um, I'm going to start keeping a list like this. And every time you speak, you answer me or you answer another student, you get one point. And of course, participation is 60%. You need to get 60 points. Now, at the end of each class, the last five minutes, I would ask volunteers to come up and do a little um, six-line skit. For that, they get two points. And at the end, they need to, whatever the topic is, whatever it is, they need to say, are there any questions? And other students can ask questions. Okay. Now, in the first term, that last five minutes was just agony because, first of all, as a teacher, you never know how much time you should allot to that. More often than not, I allotted too much time. Even when I allotted three minutes at the end of the class, it proved to be too much time because I'd say, now is presentation time, and everybody just sat staring at the floor. So what I did was I started this discrete system, right? And I told them, you know, this is the bottom line for your 60%. And again, I reminded them, you don't have to speak correctly. But you have to produce a question people can understand or a full sentence. I, as students come into class, I, this is on the table. They will often come in, check their points. Oh, I have 25. I, I need 35 more, right? When class is over, it's on the table so they can check as they go out. It created complete transparency. What I also started doing was uh, putting the syllabus up at the beginning of every class, reminding them they got absolutely no rating for showing up. Rather, they had a speaking test at the end. It's this 60% was the way to pass, right? And I would say, so far in this class, well, one student already got the full 60%. There's always one student that gets it. In this class, the top student got it after six classes. And those students are not the ones that speak best. They are the ones that get, I need to participate, and they take off. And I will review, and the next students have about 40, and I would say most students have about 25, and the lowest student has five. So. If you want to come back next year and do the same class again, I will be here. You are more than welcome. Whether you, you, I am not going to fail you. You are going to fail yourself, and it's your choice, right? And again, don't say, oh, I can't speak English, because you don't have to speak good English to get 60. Again, 60% is the pass rate for the class. So you could go to the speaking test and get zero and still pass the class if you've got the colon is to put your hand up and try, okay? So when I went to that discrete system, things changed. Any guesses to what extent student participation changed? The whole Times three. Times three. Uh, you guys are close, but not nearly. Uh, six times, 600%. Six so total student answers were up to 2,800. There were 204 per class. 
and uh, per student, on average, eight times they were volunteering and answering. Not always perfectly, but they were making an effort and they were speaking in full sentences. Um, here's my statistical stuff. You said you would, uh, I don't know what it means. My partner ran through this, <laughs> but apparently it's good or something. So, um, another thing, uh, so not only are students speaking more, but you know, every time there's a question or ask a volunteer, there are loads of hands up. The last five minutes of you know, some kind of presentation now turns into the last 30 minutes. The class is starting to move towards the Japanese lesson I took, where the teacher said, are there any questions? And everybody asked, where's this one up here, right? It's becoming student driven. The student teaching, uh, speaking rather, is 50, 60, 70, 80 percent. Um, and another thing is, they are so focused on meaning and on explaining their ideas that they are much more open to being corrected. You know? uh, they have more confidence. They know they're not perfect, but when they say something wrong and I correct them, um, they say, oh, yeah, thanks. And they, they correct it and they move forward. The focus is not on being perfect English speakers. The focus has changed to being good communicators in English. You know? And it's great when you have a student up here saying something and they take a question and you've got a student in the back and you know, it's that student that speaks in a really loud voice that you always need to say, can you speak up please? And now you've got a student up here saying, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. you know? And the student has to speak again. Or you've got a student asking a question and the presenter here is saying, I don't, I don't understand your question. Do you mean this? Do you mean that? You've got them producing this language to clarify and stuff. Because they're over the hurdle, they're not speaking one and a half times class. They're speaking eight or 10 on average. You know, and the ones above that are speaking 10, 15, 20 times. Right? Speaking in English has become the norm instead of the exception. And uh, it transforms their level of motivation and fluency. Other benefits of this kind of system. Behavioral problems, disruptions, people on their phones, virtually no problems whatsoever. I mean, it's a large classroom. It's 25 students. Uh, they're grouped in tables of four to six. They can sit wherever they want. They can bring drinks. They can bring snacks. I tell them, you're welcome to use your phone. If you need to go to the washroom, just go and come back. If you need, need to call your girlfriend, go out, call her, and come back in. I don't care what you do in class. You just need to do this. And it needs to come from you. I am not going to pick you and tell you what to say. And there are no problems. You know? The only rule is don't bother other people. Um, and so, they are motivated to use the language because the assessment is rewarding them for speaking. You know, I went to a job conference on technology and the presenter gave us some great ideas for technology you can use in the classroom. And then he said, get into groups of four or five and talk about whether you could use this technology or not at your, in your school and why. And when I turned to my group, all of the other teachers said, oh, it's a great idea, but I can't do that because if I put them in groups with technology, they'll just speak Japanese. And the next one said, oh, if they use phones, they'll just text their friend. And the next one said, you know, if I leave them alone, they'll just sit and do nothing. And I listened to all these problems people had, and I thought, no, 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 no. I don't have any of these problems. Not because I'm a great teacher or I have great students. It's the system, you know? If you have assessment where you sit through 15 classes and then you write a test at the end, that system is almost encouraging students to get lazy and let their minds wander. However, because, I guess, because it's summative. However, if you build a formative system where they can see very clearly how far they're getting towards 60, each and every class, 
it ends up motivated. You know? And so that's what I've found here. One other thing, teacher workload. You know, because student talking time is increasing, I'm finding the teacher workload is is decreasing. You know, we use a regular textbook, we use we do one unit per class. The format of the class is basically the same each time. The topics and the grammar change. And so I'm actually getting bored. I'm they know what they have to do. They do some group work and then they, they do stuff. And I'm just walking around, Makiko, what's your question? Giving her a point and Anybody answer that? Toshio answers. Thank you, Toshio. Does anyone have a comment or question for Toshio? Somebody else? You know, and if they can't understand each other or there's a huge mistake, I'm correcting them. But otherwise, I'm just giving people points while they run the lesson on their own. So not only is it better for them because they're doing all the speaking, but it's easier for the teacher as well. Okay? So just to conclude, a lot of people say, you know, Japanese students are quiet in class, that's their, their culture, you can never change them. I don't think so, you know. Um, Japanese people love to go to movies, they also love to go to karaoke. If you ask yourself what's the difference there, a movie theater is a spectator activity or sport. You don't go to a movie theater and raise your hand and say, hey, hey, I got a question, I got a question, that'd be silly, right? But by the same token, a Japanese person doesn't go to karaoke and then sit in the corner and read their book. That would also be strange. Japanese people are capable of separating these two activities and acting appropriately. I think the question that needs to be asked is, what is a classroom in 2018? And with the bevy of online courses offered by edX and Coursera from Stanford, Harvard, Princeton that are online and are free, I can't think of a reason why people should be getting showered, getting on the train and coming into a face-to-face -face, uh, event or class where they're just listening to the teacher. They might as well be at home and watch the lecture from Harvard for free. So I think, you know, teachers need to create um, need to recreate the classroom as an area, a space of exchange of ideas, but we can't expect Japanese students to, to change everything they've been through unless we change the assessment system and we remind them that it's changed in this class and we show them this is what you've done and hey, if you're this guy, you might want to reserve the, you know, book this class again next year because it seems like you're failing yourself, right? And it works, okay? So my conclusion is um, they can break out of their, their customary reticent classroom behavior, not through explanation, but rather through the assessment system. And the link there is, I think that, you know, as a global conference, as more foreign students come into the Japanese classroom, Japanese students need to be more accustomed to the global interactive way of teaching. Certainly, if they go overseas, they need to be ready to, to participate in classes. And when they go into the work world, you know, I teach at uh, NYU and Shinagawa as well, you know, they need to be able to go into meetings in English, not just understand the language, but they need to know a meeting is a participatory thing in the Western world. You don't just sit there and listen. Uh, presentation is participatory. When you meet somebody, you don't just say, my name is Stephen, I am from Toronto, I am 53 years old, my favorite color is, you know. No, it's back and forth, it's back and forth. So I think one of the most important things is students need to know that heightened language learning and the memorization of more words is not what they need to succeed globally, but rather they need to change their thinking into this Western English form of communication along with the language. And for whatever reason, this assessment system or the fear of failing is what gets them into the silo of the Western course.
Unless, of course, it's that gets them, gets them actually doing it instead of just listening to them. So to the extent that this could help any other instructors teaching English or in, in any other uh, classroom environment where participation is an issue, maybe this can, this can help. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes. Um, so, I mean, maybe perhaps you address this a little bit, but the 60%, oh, good, awesome. Uh, the 60% of just pure participation, and you said, and I understand that your point exactly, um, it doesn't matter if it's if it's right or wrong, right? Like, so you said, Roger, what day is it today? I said, oh, today's Tuesday. It's yeah. beautiful, right? You'd still give me points. Mm -hmm. um, do you, does that then, has that changed the uh, 40 percent at the end of the class where you're actually evaluating them on the quality um, and not just the quantity? That's my next paper. Uh -huh. My research shows that the speaking test scores are higher than they were when participation was lower. Mm -hmm. You know, because Roger, Roger would say Tuesday and I'd say SVO, full sentence. Okay, so Roger yeah. would say, ah, you know, today, today is, is Tuesday, and half the class will laugh, uh -huh. and I'll say, okay, Roger, good answer, you know, that's nice, but can anybody add to that? And Makiko will say, ah, today is Saturday. And by this time, Roger's laughing, and Makiko's laughing, and everybody's laughing. It's very supportive, mm -hmm. you know. So what you end up getting is, you know, four different full sentence utterances. One that's wrong, one that corrects, mm -hmm. right? And so, just by virtue of increasing the volume of English being used, it seems that it increases in the learning form. Yeah, I mean, that, that shouldn't really be surprising, right? What's the, the best way to, uh, to improve is to do it and get positive feedback and get confidence and then do it more and then you get better exactly. at it, yeah. yeah. Um, just one, one more question. Just what, what would a typical class be? Like, what would you be talking about? What would the topic be? your very okay. small lecture and then their small group discussions, what would yeah. you be talking about? So like here, here are the slides for the class. We'd start like this. I always remind them where we are today. I always 